to see you there. Genesis chapter 32, going to start reading in the first verse. Let's talk about running on empty, running on empty. The Bible says, <clears throat> Jacob also went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Sair, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and I have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my lord that I might find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau and he is now coming to meet you with 400 men. Yikes. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country, your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid that he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted." He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. Now, won't take time and read all the verses in this chapter, but uh, Esau selected a gift of 550 animals, and he sent them towards his brother Esau in five waves. We'll talk about that a little bit, but look with me in verse 21. So Jacob's gifts went ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? <clears throat> Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men you have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed them there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it was because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. <coughs> Excuse me. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Let's talk about running on empty for a few minutes this morning. Beloved, God wants to bring each of us to a place called empty. He wants to bring us to a place of total surrender to him. He wants to bring us to a place of total trust in him, of total dependence upon him. He wants to bring us to a place where we stop living by self-reliance and live by faith instead, relying on him alone. Solomon described a place called empty this way, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. John the Baptist described the place called empty this way. He must increase, but I must decrease. Paul described the place called empty this way. But whatever were credits to me, I now consider debits for the sake of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of Christ for whose sake I have lost all things. Jesus demonstrated a place called empty when he prayed this way, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You know, Jesus' prayer in the garden was the culmination of a life lived in a place called empty. Paul wrote, although he himself was God, he didn't grasp that equality with God. Rather, he emptied himself. And he became humble and an obedient servant, even to death on the cross. You see, that's what it means to come to a place called empty. It means that we stop grasping for control of our own lives and we let God be in control. It means we humble ourselves and we surrender completely to him. Genesis chapter 32 is the story of how God brought Jacob to a place called empty. Right now we're looking at stories of faith together. We're looking at some of the heroes of the Bible and considering the defining moments of faith in their lives. What can we learn from them? What encouragement can we draw from them? You see, as a church family, we've come to our own defining moment of faith. We're just a few short weeks away from the fulfillment of a dream that's been in the making for 20 years now to find a permanent home for harvest time, a place big enough for a thousand people. And I know in my spirit that when we cross over the threshold into that physical building, we're also going to step into the fulfillment of many prophecies that the Lord has given us. But right now we have a financial challenge that needs to be met. We're in urgent need of about a quarter of a million dollars to finish our new sanctuary, get a temporary certificate of occupancy, and we need a little bit more for downstairs. So we're asking you to stand in prayer with us, to stand in sacrificial giving with us, and to stand in faith. This week, we had a wonderful testimony from our friend Stephen April Gale, who the Lord met in a very unexpected way on Monday as they reached to make their pledge. It was so good, I asked Stephen April to share it for us. They recorded a little video at home. Take a look at the screens. Hi everyone, my name is Steve, and I've been a member of Harvest Time for about seven years now. And when I originally made the pledge towards phase two with my wife April, it was back during the original campaign, uh, capital campaign in 2013. And over the years, we've our family and friends have grown as we've gotten more ingrained in the church, and, and the church has always been there for us. So it was really important for us to um, do our part and to help the church uh, with their need with phase two. And in particular, in 2016, my wife and I had one of the toughest years of our lives, and in particular with our marriage. And the church was there every step of the way to help us wherever we needed it. And, you know, in the process of between our original pledge in 2013 and that point, you know, life took over. We bought a house, we had, a, um, we had our daughter, Emma, and at that point, you know, uh, we weren't able to give as much towards our pledge as we were originally planning. So we kind of fallen behind. We were about halfway through, and but by the end of the year, last year, we knew deep down, and we also heard it from the Holy Spirit that it was important that we fulfill our pledge. So from December of last year, we really put every ounce of effort that we could towards it. Every single dollar that we got that was extra, whether it was taxes, just extra money from work, whatever the case may be, we put towards our uh, obligation for phase two, our original pledge, and. It's been truly um, so amazing to see what the Lord has done to bless us along the way. Um, for instance, my wife is now pregnant with our second child. Um, he blessed me with a job with a salary greater than I could ever imagine, actually. Uh, this And I started back in July of this year. And, and all of this was because of our commitment to really fulfilling our original pledge to the church. You know, we took it seriously and it was, you know, it's an obligation that we wanted to make sure that we saw our part through. And so over the course of the year, we've been putting every single dollar that we can towards it. And it culminated this last Sunday with, um, we're right down to the wire with our pledge. And we ultimately decided that, you know, we didn't have the cash right now, per se. So we decided to go um, the route of putting it on a credit card because we knew the church, you know, is in crunch time with the a renovation or with the building. So we wanted to make sure that they got the money now so we put it on a credit card and this was sunday night after we prayed about it 
and the next day the Lord blessed us with a check from the state uh, it was for that amount and it was actually exceeding the amount that we had just put on our credit card and it just goes to show that not only does God provide he provides in your hour of need he provides when you need it the most and he rewards those that are faithful and all I can say is that I love this church. I love the pastors. Everyone here is such a blessing. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we just thank you all and we love you all. God bless. That's a good testimony, isn't it? When we need faith, the place to turn is the Bible. We started looking at Abraham, the man of faith. Last week, we looked at his son, Isaac. Today... Let's look at Jacob's defining moment of faith when God brought him to a brook called Jabbok, which means emptying. God brought Jacob to Jabbok to finally empty him out. As I look at this story, I see a few truths about a place called empty, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. A few truths about a place called empty. First of all, why does God need to bring us to a place called empty? Why does God need to bring us to a place called empty? Looking at Jacob, God brought him to a place called empty because Jacob's faith was not yet complete. It was not fully formed. It was not mature. Jacob believed in God. He knew God. He even had some dramatic encounters with God. Nevertheless, Jacob had never really surrendered completely to God. Even from before he was born, Jacob always tried to be in control of his own destiny. He always tried to get the upper hand through less than noble means. He always tried to get ahead. He always grasped at what he wanted. He was born grasping onto his twin brother's heel. His name means grabber. He grabbed at things by any means. How opposite of that is Jesus, who is God, and yet he didn't grab at the honor and the dignity that was rightly due him. Just like Jacob, God also has to bring us to a place called empty because our faith is not yet complete. James wrote about that in the New Testament. He said, consider it joy when you encounter diverse trials and temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith makes you patient and let God finish his work so that you might be mature and complete. You see, we're not all there yet. So God uses trials to get us there. Why does God need to bring us to a place called empty? Because many have received inherited faith, but haven't experienced identity-changing faith. You know, when I first came to Christ back in the 1970s, we had a popular little saying. By the way, I dragged this shirt with me from the 70s. <clears throat> we had a popular little saying back then, God has no grandchildren. And it's true. You know, just because your parents are believers in Jesus doesn't mean that you are a believer in Jesus by extension. God has only sons and daughters. He doesn't have any grandsons and granddaughters. You have to have your own encounter and your own relationship with God. Just because your spouse or your significant other is a believer in Jesus doesn't mean that you're good to go with God by extension. Jesus only has brothers and sisters. He has no brothers-in-law or sisters-in-law. Your spouse's relationship with Christ does bring a special blessing on your home, but it won't help you on that great and final day when you stand before Christ. You have to know him personally. At this stage in his life, Jacob was more like a grandson to God than a son. Genesis 32 is the story of Jacob's journey to make God his own. In the beginning of Genesis 32, Jacob prays a prayer and he addresses God as God of my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac. But he doesn't address God as my God. And the point is this, that up to this moment, God was only the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. 
But after God brings Jacob through a place called empty, Jacob addresses God in chapter 33 as El Elohi Israel, God, the God of Israel, which is his new name. So it was at a place called empty that God finally became the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And God has to lead many of us to a place called empty for precisely the same reason. Beloved, if you want to know what is the greatest problem in America today, it is not the left, it is not the right, it is not presidential tweets, it is not the gay rights lobby, it is not the gun lobby. If you want to know what is the greatest problem, it's inherited religion. God has way too many grandchildren. People who inherited some form of faith from their parents, but who've never had an encounter with God that has radically transformed their identity. Amen. Jacob believed in God. He knew God. He had encounters with God. And yet from the womb, his sinful identity was never changed. He was born a grabber. He lived his whole life a grabber. And even now, as an older man, he is still a grabber. I find that many people are like that today. They genuinely believe in God. Perhaps they've had encounters with him. He's a major part of their worldview, and yet they don't live relying upon him. They don't live surrendered to him. They don't live in obedience to him, focused on him. Culturally, they're Christians, but he's not the object of their passionate pursuit. And so they function out of their own human strength, directed by their carnal nature, guided by their own wisdom, rather than guided by the Holy Spirit. And they will continue to do so until they come to a place called empty. Why does God bring us to a place called empty? Because we are walking in both generational blessings and generational iniquity. Because of the faith of Abraham and Isaac, the blessing of the Lord rested on Jacob. Because of their obedience to God, favor was on Jacob. Because of their offerings to God, God made Jacob wealthy. When people tried to cheat Jacob, God prospered him wildly. When people threatened Jacob, God protected him. For 20 years, working under Uncle Laban, Jacob tried to get rich through one mischievous scheme after another, but it was the blessing of the Lord that made him rich, not his striving. Beloved, some of us need to wake up and realize that the reason that we are so blessed today is not because of our own cleverness or hard work, but it's because our parents were faithful to God. Because they served like Jacob, we are blessed. Because they tithed and gave sacrificially, we are blessed. Because they feared the Lord and obeyed him. We are blessed. See, I feel that some of us are in danger of pride today. Thinking like Jacob that somehow we're responsible for our blessings. And so we feel that we're entitled to do whatever we want with them. Hebrews says this, keep your lives free from the love of money. And remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Beloved, don't make God take you to a place called empty like Jacob before you humble yourself and realize that he's the one who's blessed you. But Jacob wasn't only walking in generational blessing, he was also walking in generational iniquity. You see, the Bible says that we are all born with a bent towards certain kinds of sin. Depending on the lives of our parents and our grandparents and their parents, some of us are born with a bent towards addiction. Some of us are born with a bent toward sexual sin. Some of us are born with a bent toward anger or abuse or dishonesty. In Jacob's family, there was the generational sin of marital dysfunction. There was a generational sin of unfaithfulness 
to monogamy in the covenant of marriage. There was a generational sin of parental dysfunction, favoritism, and rejection, and manipulation, and scheming, and sibling rivalry. Read the story. Abraham's family put the funk in dysfunctional. <laughs> there was a generational sin of self-reliance. Abraham was a liar, Isaac was a liar, and Jacob comes along and his name means liar. But the lying and the scheming were all just symptoms of an underlying disease, which was self-reliance, taking matters into my own hands rather than trusting God. You know, a lot of us today are a lot like Jacob. We have an inherited faith, but perhaps one that has not yet changed our sinful identity. We're walking in generational blessing, but we are also walking in generational iniquity. So God has to bring us to a place called empty so that he can empty that out of us. Why does God need to bring us to a place called empty? Because the contents of our prayer life exceeds the content of our thought life and our actions in life. In Genesis 32, Jacob prays a prayer that represents a significant turning point in his life. You remember with me how Jacob deceived his brother Esau and stole the birthright. He, he, he got Esau to trade his birthright for a pot of soup. And then he deceived his father and got his father to pray over him the blessing of the firstborn. When Esau discovered what had happened, he wanted to kill Jacob. Jacob ran for his life and he spent 20 years toiling under crooked Uncle Laban. And then God spoke to Jacob. He said, go home, face your brother. When Jacob comes back to the promised land, he sends word to Esau, I'm coming home. And a message comes back that Esau is coming to welcome him with <clears throat> a little welcoming party of 400 men. <laughs> Jacob is terrified. And for the first time, this is the first time in the story of Jacob that he prays his prayer. First time he prays. And it's a good prayer. He acknowledges that he's been a rascal and that he doesn't deserve God's favor. He acknowledges that everything he has is because of God's blessing and not because of his scheming. And he asks God to preserve him from Esau's anger. See, Jacob's prayer is an indication that his heart is moving in the right direction. His heart is moving towards humility. His heart is moving towards gratitude. His heart is moving towards godly sorrow and repentance. His heart is moving towards faith as he recalls God's promises to him. It's a good prayer. But here's what I want you to notice. Immediately after he prays his prayer, Jacob goes right back to being Jacob. He selects a gift of 550 animals and sends them in several waves to Esau. Rather than facing his brother in genuine repentance, he's trying to placate his brother with a gift. The gift would also serve to disrupt any plans that Esau might have to ambush Jacob. You see, it's a little hard to sneak up on someone when you have 220 goats with you. It's hard to sneak up on someone when you have 220 sheep and 30 camels and 50 cows and 30 donkeys in tow. If Esau and his men were positioned for ambush, every time another wave of animals reached them, they would have to reposition themselves all over again. 550 animals would also slow down Esau's advance. 550 animals would also serve to pay off any mercenary soldiers that Esau might have hired to help him. You see, mercenary soldiers worked for a share of the spoils of war. But if Esau had a change of heart and decided not to attack Jacob, the gift would make a way for Esau to pay off those soldiers for their service without any cost to him. Jacob had each group say that he was coming directly behind them. And then he planned to send his two wives and kids ahead of him, the least favorite wives first and then the favorite wife. And guess who was all the way dead last? Jacob. You see, for once in his life, the guy who always had to be first wanted to be last. 
far from a sincere gesture of apology. Jacob's elaborate gift was really just another one of his elaborate schemes aimed at manipulating his brother, using his own family as pawns, all to save his own skin. Jacob's heart was moving in the right direction, but his head was still full of wrong thinking. And his actions were still full of deceit. And beloved, I want to tell you, we can be just like that too. Our heart, really, in our heart, we want to do the right thing, but we're so used to scheming. We're so used to our little tricks and our way of getting by that we keep right on doing those things. That's why David prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart, and test my thoughts, and examine my ways. Beloved, some of us, we pray the right things every day and we really mean it from our heart. But then we go right out there and go back to acting like Jacob again. So God has to bring us to a place called empty. Why does God need to bring us to a place called empty? Because some of us are stubborn to the bitter end. If there's one thing I've learned in 25 years of pastoring, it's this. You can be dead broke and still not broken. Jacob was in terrible fear, but he still wasn't broken inside. He was in earnest prayer, but he still wasn't broken inside. The duration and the intensity of the wrestling match is an indication of just how firmly Jacob was grasping on to his old ways. It wasn't until his hip was dislocated and he was exhausted and in excruciating pain that he finally relented. And we can be stubborn like that too, stubborn to the bitter end. And so God has to bring us to a place called empty. Why does God need to bring us to a place called empty? Because our fam family needs us, especially our children. God brought Jacob to a place called empty because it was time for Jacob to get his act together for the sake of his kids. You see, Abraham was obedient to the Lord and God blessed his son. Isaac was obedient to the Lord and God blessed his kids. Now it was Jacob's turn to get with the program for the sake of the next generation. Parents, please, please, Hear me this morning. The seeds that you sow by the lives that you live will affect your kids, whether good or bad. See, here's the thing about generational iniquity. It grows worse with each generation. Abraham was a liar. Isaac was a liar. Then Jacob is born and his name means liar. He deceives his own father. And then Jacob's sons perpetrate the mother of all lies. They sell their brother into slavery. They tell their father he was killed by an animal in the field. And listen to this. Ten of them, ten of them keep that lie for decades. Do you realize what a hardcore pack of liars you have to be for ten men to keep up a lie for decades and not one of them to crack? And spill the truth. No, no. God looked at that and he said, somebody has got to break this curse of generational iniquity. Somebody has got to stop these dominoes from falling. Someone has got to intercede for these 12 boys. Someone has got to speak the word of God over them. And Jacob, you're going to be it. The writer of Hebrews says, by faith, Jacob blessed each of Joseph's children. And he worshipped as he leaned on his staff. You see, Jacob, after he went through a place called empty, Jacob became an intercessor. He became the prophetic voice for his family. Parents, listen to me, please. I plead with you. You are your children's intercessor. You need to pray that their faith is not just an inherited faith, but their faith becomes an identity-changing faith. Your family needs an intercessor and a prophetic voice so God will take you through a place called empty. A few truths about a place called empty. Why does God need to bring us there? And second, how 
does God bring us to a place called empty? How does God bring us there? When Jacob received news that Esau was coming with his little welcoming party, he prayed and then he dispatched his strategic gift. Then he gathered all of his wives and kids and all of his belongings and he sent them across the brook called Jabbok at night. Remember that Jabbok means emptying. The Jabbok brook runs through a deep ravine. It's hard enough crossing a stream in the daylight over the slippery rocks. Imagine doing it at night. Hundreds of people and thousands of animals. When everyone was across the brook, Jacob stayed alone on the far side. In the night, a mysterious man approached him and challenged him to a contest of strength. You know, that's not really part of our culture anymore. It was in America's frontier days and it was in Jacob's day. And there at a place called Empty, the two men wrestled intensely all night until Jacob was utterly spent. Few of us will ever visit the brook called Jabbok in Israel. Few of us will ever wrestle an angel. So how does God bring us to a place called Empty? Well, he uses crises in which we see ourselves as God sees us. When I was working at the Assemblies of God headquarters in Missouri, I heard a story from a missionary who came off the field in Africa. A chief's wife came to their mission station one day seeking medical help for a sickness she had. The missionaries cared for her for several days. I think it was 10 days or two weeks. They, they prayed for her. They uh, helped her rest and, and did what they could. And they shared the gospel with her and she received Christ. She went home to her village healed and very happy. But when her husband, the chief, saw her, he was upset. He said to her, who put that light in your eyes? I don't like that light. You see, the presence of Christ in her had changed her countenance. She told him that the missionaries prayed for her and that their God, Jesus, healed her and that she had received Jesus. It was his light in her eyes. The next day, the chief dressed up in his full battle regalia and he went with his wife to the missionaries to demand that they remove the light from her eyes. But when he got to the mission station, the missionary had a mirror hanging on a tree outside that he used to shave every day. In his entire life, the chief had never once seen his own reflection. He was very fearful. He, he said to the missionary, who is that ugly man looking at me out of the tree? I don't like that man. He scares me. The missionary tried to explain to him that it was his own reflection. In anger, the chief took his rod and he struck the mirror and it smashed into a thousand little pieces. And then when he looked down on the ground, his reflection was in every single piece of glass. And he screamed and he said, take away this ugly man. The missionary told the chief that only Jesus could take away the ugly man in the mirror. The chief prayed to receive Jesus, and when he and his wife went home, there were two people with the light of Jesus in their eyes. The chief asked the missionary to come to the village and pray for every person so that every one of them would have the light of Jesus in their eyes. What was the purpose of God's all-might wrestling match with Jacob? It was a mirror. It was an acted out parable of Jacob's entire life. From his mother's womb, Jacob spent his life wrestling with men and with God. He spent his entire life grasping at anything and everything. He grasped at a position. He grasped at attention. He grasped at possessions. He grasped at power. When he saw Rachel, he grasped at her beauty. The ugliness of the wrestling match was to show Jacob just how ugly his grasping was in God's eyes. 
God intended for Jacob to see himself as God saw him desperately struggling, sweating, exhausting himself to win an unwinnable fight against an undefeatable opponent when it was all so unnecessary. The blessing of God waited just on the other side of his surrender. Beloved, God uses crises the same way in our lives to show us ourselves as he sees us. See, crises bring out who we really are and what we're really made of. They expose our points of weakness and the incompleteness of our faith. How does God bring us to a place called empty? By bringing us to a moment when we're at risk of losing everything precious to us. Jacob was at risk of losing his family. He was at risk of losing his entire life savings, everything he worked for for 20 years under Laban's harsh employment. You see, even Laban was a mirror in Jacob's life. They were two peas in a pod, the two of them. And he tried to defraud Jacob again and again. He cut Jacob's pay 10 times in 20 years. You see, God might let you work for someone who's just like you to show you just how ugly you really can be. Mm, you think your boss is the devil or the devil's sister? Be careful. Maybe God's trying to send you a message. Look in the mirror, honey. <laughs> Jacob was at risk of losing his very life. And so God may use crises like these to bring us to a place called empty too. In 25 years of pastoring, how many men and women have I seen who refuse to humble themselves until they're on the cusp of losing their marriages and their families? Why does it take separation? Why does it take someone to file divorce papers? Why does it take hashing out custody agreements? over our innocent children before we finally reach a place called empty? How many people refuse to honor God with their giving while they're riding high and yet come running to Him when they've been downsized? How many people refuse to surrender to the Lord until they're sick in their bodies? How does God bring us to a place called empty? By bringing us to a moment when we have to face unresolved issues or the consequences of our actions. After 20 years on the run, it was finally time for Jacob to face the music. It was finally time to face his brother and his father who was still alive. And so God will bring us face to face with our unresolved issues. He'll lead us into situations where we have to return to certain places and we have to see certain people again and perhaps we have to offer an apology or make reparations. How does God bring us to a place called empty? By bringing us up against scary deadlines. Esau was on the way with his little welcoming army. They were traveling fast. The clock was ticking. Sometimes God will use the crisis of deadlines in our lives too. You know, in 1997, we received a deadline from the town of Greenwich to vacate the building that we were renting in Glenville. It was that crisis that pushed us to find this property, and we found it just in the nick of time. You know, we paid one and a half million dollars for this 10 and a half acres. A year later, I was offered six million dollars for this property. That's what happened to the market in one year when Brunswick School bought over 100 acres to the south of us. You see, God uses the crisis of deadline sometimes to move us in position so that he can bless us and we don't even know what's happening at the time. How does God bring us to a place called empty? By allowing us to experience helplessness. Jacob was helpless against Esau and he was helpless against the mysterious man. All of his help was on the other side of the brook at a place called empty. Jacob was alone and empty handed. You see, it's not until we're utterly helpless do we look to God as our only source of help. How does God bring us to a place called empty? By allowing us to experience loneliness. God waited until Jacob was alone to confront him. And sometimes God allows us to be in a lonely place so that he can confront us and work on us. How does God bring us to a place called empty? By allowing us to experience exhaustion. 
the mysterious man wrestled with Jacob all night until Jacob was utterly exhausted. Beloved, sometimes our human will is so strong, our soul is so strong that God has to just go ahead and let us wear ourselves out so that we're finally ready to yield to him. How does God bring us to a place called empty? By allowing us to experience real pain. By dawn, every muscle in Jacob's body was quivering from the strain of the contest. His head was pounding from the stress and from dehydration. His hands were aching from grasping his opponent. Emotionally, he was wrung out. This wrestling match was the last thing he needed on the night before he had to face his brother. And then the man touched Jacob's hip and dislocated it. It never really was a contest. Jacob hollered in pain. A wave of nausea washed over him. Sweat poured from him. The kind of sweat that comes from being in intense pain. His leg went limp. You know, it's not a popular thought, but it is true. God uses real pain in our lives to affect change in us. He uses the pain of loss. He uses the pain of rejection and betrayal. He uses the pain of failure. He uses the pain of bearing our consequences. He uses the pain of fear, of need. He even uses physical pain. How does God bring us to a place called empty? By hiding his face from us. Jacob didn't know who he was wrestling with. In Hebrew, it simply says an individual wrestled with him. Was it a man? Was it an angel? Was it God? Jacob didn't know. It was dark. I don't know how much time you spent out there camping, but I want to tell you, when you leave the lights of New York City, it's dark out there at night. A while back ago, I was working here in the office, and I stayed quite late. And when I went to go home, I, I walked out my office door, and it shut behind me and locked and I was locked out of my office, and my keys were inside. I didn't want to call Denise and disturb her, didn't want to wake her, wake up the kids, so most of you know I just live a couple doors down, so I decided to walk home. But I wasn't really prepared for just how dark it is on King Street late at night. Now, over the years, we've had an interesting menagerie of wildlife that has passed <laughs> through our campus. We've had coyotes. We've had bobcats. We've had a black bear. A bear will kill you now. We, we had a mountain lion and, of course, skunks. I wasn't really bothered by the dark. I was bothered by what might be lurking in the dark. So I walked straight down the middle of King Street on the double yellow line, <laughs> singing to myself all the way home just to keep myself comforted. It was pitch black. Jacob was wrestling with a mysterious man. He spent the entire night face to face with God, but he couldn't see that. And sometimes it's the same with us. It is God at work in the midst of our circumstances, but we can't recognize that it's him. It's God at work in our crisis. It is God at work in the midst of our frustration and our fear. It is God at work in our helplessness, in our exhaustion, in our loneliness, in our pain. It's God at work bringing us to a place called empty so that he can bless us. A few truths about a place called empty. Why does God need to bring us there? How does he bring us there? And finally, what happens when we finally arrive at a place called empty? At daybreak, the mysterious man says to Jacob, let me go, the sun is rising. See, it was out of mercy he said this because no one can see the face of God and live. But Jacob, the grabber, refused to let go of him. So with a single touch, the man dislocates Jacob's hip. With his hip dislocated, the nature of Jacob's grasping changes. Jacob realizes that he's not wrestling with any man, but he's wrestling with God. He is no longer grasping 
in strength, but now he's grasping in weakness. He's no longer grasping in pride, but he's grasping in desperation. God has taken everything out of the grabber's hand until he has nothing left to grab onto but God himself. And that's when Jacob finally reached the place called empty. When we finally arrive at the place called empty, we experience inner brokenness. Through his intense pain, Jacob continued to hold on tight to God and he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. The prophet Hosea gives us insight into this whole wrestling match. In Hosea chapter 12, he writes this, Jacob grasped his brother by the heel in the womb, listen, and in his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. Listen, he wept and pleaded for favor with him. You see, there's a turning point in this wrestling match. Jacob begins wrestling God in his strength, but he ends weeping and pleading with God for a blessing. At a place called empty, he finally became broken inside. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. That's what Jacob experienced during the wrestling match. When we finally arrive at a place called empty, we experience tenacious faith. As the sun began to peak on the horizon, Jacob held on to God, not with human strength, but with the strength that faith brings. Jacob pressed God to give him what he could not grab for himself. He had grabbed for everything else in life. Now he was grabbing for God. When we reach a place called empty, we prevail with God. God says to Jacob, you have struggled, listen to these words, you have struggled with God and with men you have prevailed. Jacob spent his entire life struggling with men his brother, his father, his crooked uncle. But the way that Jacob prevailed was through humility. It wasn't through strength, but it was through weakness. It was through confession. It was through faith. And when he prevailed in humility, he prevailed with men. When we reach the place called empty, we receive a new identity. God asked Jacob, what is your name? Now God knew who he was wrestling with. God can see in the dark. He has night vision. He knew it was Jacob. But he wanted Jacob to say his name. Because when Jacob says his name, he's confessing. Yeah, I'm that grabber. I'm that one. I'm that deceiver. I'm that opportunist. I'm that one who always had to get ahead. Who always had to be first. God says to him, you will no longer be called Jacob, but you will be called Israel. Israel means God fights. God fights for us to win over our heart, and then God fights for us against our enemies. When we reach a place called empty, we speak with new faith. The angel blesses Jacob and he leaves before the sun comes up and Jacob makes a confession of faith. He said, I have seen God face to face, therefore my life will be preserved. Now I want you to notice, nothing has changed. Esau is still coming with 400 men and now Jacob has a limp, he's weak in body, he's exhausted and his hip is broken is dislocated but he's not afraid because he's seen God beloved when the fear of God lives in you you will not be afraid of men the writer of Hebrews says keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Therefore, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can a mere man do to me? Jacob spoke by faith, 
Nothing had changed, but he had changed inside. And he said, I have seen God, therefore my life will be preserved. When we reached a place called empty, we walk with a new walk. As the sun came up, Jacob came walking across the brook called Jabbok. He was walking a new way. He was walking fearlessly, but with a limp. If you read into chapter 33, you'll find out that Jacob spots Esau coming his way. But this time, Jacob doesn't hide behind his servants. He doesn't hide behind his wives. He doesn't hide behind his children or all of his stuff. Genesis 33 verse 3 says that Jacob himself went ahead of all of them and he bowed seven times to his brother. No more schemes, no more tricks, no more ruses, just sincere contrition. Esau sprinted towards Jacob and the Bible says he grabbed a hold of him. It's the same word of grabbing of the wrestling match, but this was not the grabbing of strife. This was the grabbing of reconciliation. 20 years of brokenness and bitterness and alienation was healed in an instant when Jacob finally reached a place called empty running on empty why does God need to bring us to that place how does he bring us there and what happens when we finally arrive at a place called empty would you stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise in this place today come on give Jesus a good praise